This is the FYI on Youth Ministry, a youth ministry podcast from the Fuller Youth Institute. This season, we are continuing our series on discipleship that forms Christ-like characteristics. In this episode, we talk about the connections between love, humility, and lament. But first, let's hear what young people had to say about today's topic. How would you define love? Love is like kindness and caring about someone. Uh, I would say like, not for no reason, but like kind of for no reason, like for no benefit. Kind of actions help you know that you are loved. Asking like, do you need help? Do you, you want me to do this for you? Looks like you're, looks like you're busy. Showing care to, to one another, and to know that you want to be there for them, you know. I don't really know much about humility. I don't really hear much about like people describing leadership as having humility towards people. I don't know because I've never heard it as much. It's piqued my interest to like learn more about that. Hello everyone, this is Ralston Hernandez. I am Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Manager and Content Producer at the Fuller Youth Institute. And I am with a new co-host today. Hey everybody, my name is Chuck Hunt and I am the Senior Director of Training and DEI here at the Fuller Youth Institute. And today we are so excited to step into these two Christ-like characteristics and talk about um, these things um, in depth. Um, One of those is love. The other one is humility. Both of those not super popular uh, in today's world, but I'm really looking forward to talking about these characteristics. And our conversation partner is Professor Sung Chan Ra. Sung Chan Ra joined Fuller's faculty in 2021 as the Robert Boyd Munger Professor of Evangelism. He has authored and co-authored over a half dozen books, and he also brings the experience of being a pastor and a father. So thanks so much for being here. Good to be here. So before we dive deeper and more practically into lament and love and humility, I wonder if you can share a story with us. Um, Speaking from your experience as a parent and a pastoral leader, do you remember a time when a young person taught you something about love or humility? Well, as a parent, um, I think pretty much all of one's parental experiences of humility, uh, because you are reminded that there is so little you know or understand about being a parent. And uh, my kids are kind of grown. They're 22 and 20. So they're at a different stage of life. But even when they were younger, there was always this uh, stress and tension of trying to be a good parent and realizing that you will never live up to your self-perception of what that means. Uh, And now when they're adults, um, there's a pretty consistent, persistent reminder uh, that you are not what you wish for them to see and be. And just recognizing that uh, there's always, always a growth edge when you are working with young people. Uh, And even some of your experiences that you thought were helpful and were good uh, doesn't always translate over. And that you have to really be recognizing that it's always a learning curve, no matter what experiences you think you might have had. Oh, my gosh, that's so good. As a father, uh, before I had my daughter, who's now 20, um, someone told me that uh, she would teach me more about God than I would ever want to want to admit. But talking about sadness and, and, and more importantly, I mean, I think that sadness for me as a father um, was really um, moments of lament. Um, and you've written a book uh, about prophetic lament. Um, can you tell us a little bit about kind of the worship research um, that you found that you did um, as you were writing the book? Yeah. So when I wrote the book several years ago, one of the research that I wanted to do as a a setup to the book was what uh, what is our worship life in the church like and uh, why is lament absent in that and uh, a research project showed that even in churches where they were assigned to read lament or sing lament hymns or read lament psalms uh, these churches just kind of dropped those sad hymns and replaced them with happier hymns or dropped the lament psalms 
and replace them with happier psalms. So even when you were assigned certain texts, there was this tendency to avoid the songs of lament or songs of suffering. Now, if you compare that to the scriptures, to the Bible in the Psalms, which are 150 chapters, about a, a two-thirds uh, or 60% of the Psalms are what we would call Psalms of celebration, victory, triumph, good things are happening. But at least 40% of the Psalms are what we call Psalms of lament. And now if you look at contemporary worship, it's even worse. Uh, contemporary worship is more like 95% of our top 100 contemporary worship songs uh, are talking about celebration and victory and triumph, and only about 5% talk about suffering and pain. So it seems that in our in our traditional worship, in our uh, liturgical worship, and even in our contemporary worship, there are these patterns of worship life that seem to indicate that the church in America in particular does not know how to deal with suffering and pain because we're so caught up in, hey, we're going to celebrate, we're going to jump up and down for joy, which has its moments, which is appropriate, but is it 95% of the time that that's what our life is supposed to be about? Uh, or is it more likely, like in the Bible, 60% of psalms of praise and 40% psalms of lament? That's really interesting. I mean, it makes me think through is this idea, theological reality, that God calls us to remember. And yes. that remembrance is not just about remembering the good things that have brought us to where we are, but the negative things that we should be staying away from. And as yes. as we kind of think about the, our audience of youth leaders, right, how do we see that idea of remembrance um, or the lament piece of remembrance? How can they be more intentional, youth leaders, about um, including that within, you know, that, that scriptural framework or in, including that in their worship practice? Let me tell you something. Our youth are, are savvy and they have something called the internet, they can look all of this up. They have a really high BS meter. And so if we tell them Christian life means everything's perfect, everything is awesome, everything is cool, we're being dishonest with the youth. But if we say, you know what? Um, Christians have messed up. Your parents have messed up. Uh, your elders and leaders have messed up. Uh, we have grown up with some really messed up narratives and stories. Uh, we have done some stupid things as a church, uh, as a nation. And our young people are not stupid. And if we as a church keep telling them, don't worry about it, it's in the past, don't worry about it, uh, why, why deal with all this negative stuff in the past, then their answer could very well be then, okay, then I don't have to worry about my sin either. If you're not worried about the sins of this nation, the sins of the church, then why are you worried about my sin? For us as a church to gloss over all these things that are going on in the world that our young people already know about, uh, racism, uh, sexism, uh, the violence towards uh, the oppressed, uh, hunger and famine, all of these truths have to be told. It's part of the story. And the more we lie to our children or hide these truths, the more hypocritical we become. When we talk about remembering, uh, I also think of like remembering, like bringing something back together. And uh, I mean, these stories from all of these people, all the injustice, all of, and just even cultural wealth that comes from other places, it can help us help our students remember all of these narratives there's something I think it was from Richard Rohr. He mentions we can't really bypass hard emotions, right? We have to go through them. And so as we remember all these narratives and we help our students go through the emotions, instead of just saying like, oh, we're only celebrating or we're so amazing. Yes. We're, we're processing all of that, helping them be critical about it, but also have and and in that process, have this humility, have the love, but also some uh, hope for the future because it can look kind of grim for our young people today. And that's that's a beautiful theology that I think we've glossed over, which is um, I am disconnected with many parts of the body of Christ. And I, and I love that language of remembering, as in we are brought back together as the body of Christ. And that remembering um, is kind of the uh, reconnecting but also I want to remember alongside. So if I'm going to be connected to the black community, the black church, the First Nations community, the Latina community, I need to hear their stories. I need to know what formed them, the lament that they are experiencing. Otherwise, I'm just disconnected. I'm just seeing them from afar, almost like a tourist. But I really want to be remembered with them and in the process, hear their stories and learn from their narratives. So wonderful. And it kind of also reminds me that 
we learn to be more human by how we see other people be human in their contexts and be, yes. become more full, right? And so lament is a spiritual practice that gives us the space to be human and to not be perfect and to feel difficult emotions. But it's also a way in which we can cultivate love and humility in ourselves and in which we and in ways that we can help our students cultivate love and humility, humility as well. So can you tell us, how lament is connected to love? Yeah, I think lament really emerges from love because lament is a, a snapshot of an appropriate response to the reality of pain and suffering in the world. So if you see pain and suffering that is in the world to say, um, you know, there's a pain and suffering that happens. Love causes me to say, I need to lament alongside. If there were not love in that, it would be judgment. But my lament comes out of my love that says, God, this is wrong. Well, my response of love is to go into that space and lament alongside the mother that has lost her child, lament alongside a community that has lost one of their own. So lament without love doesn't exist because lament is the appropriate response to the reality of pain and suffering in the world. That's why lament is so powerful because we go to the places of brokenness and out of our love, we lament alongside those that are broken. To me, that comes back to like what we're talking in the beginning, right? That we don't know how to lament in the first place about our own thing. So how are we going to know how to love others and lament with others if we don't know how to love ourselves in the first place or just give ourselves the space for lament? Yes. Absolutely. I I don't think we I don't know if we have a solution for that other than <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll I'll give an example. So the story that I often share is that my mom was a single mom, uh, raising four kids in inner city Baltimore. Uh, we were on food stamps, we were in subsidized housing, kind of all the markers that in the eyes of the world made us look bad. Meanwhile, my mom was working 20 hours a, a day, uh, six days a week to try to keep our family together. So when I think about that humility of my mom to do everything she can to keep her family together, there was this profound humility and love that led her to be one of the most incredible prayer warriors. And um, she did that because there was nowhere else for her to turn except towards her Lord and Savior. All she could do, all she could do, was turn to God and pray and, and lament before God. And I think we're missing that in the church when we don't know how to pray and lament because we are so filled with overconfidence about our own capacity and capability. I can fix this. I can figure this out. When actually, when we are at the place where, no, you can't figure it out. No, you don't have all the right answers. No, money isn't going to solve this problem. No, you don't have the knowledge and know-how and education to make this work out. That's when someone like my mom falls on her knees and prays to God. And it feels like that's missing in the church because we're so caught up in our own triumphalism, our own exceptionalism, our own sense of accomplishment. I'm so with you in terms of that idea that we're so caught up in our own triumphalism, right? Like, how do we get past some of that? For youth leaders who are millennials or Gen X, how can they help guide their students, not just through love and humility, to identify with their other people around them, but to a place of biblical lament? I'll say that there's kind of two pandemics that have been going along simultaneously in our culture over the last several years. The pandemic, the COVID pandemic, and the epidemic of depression, anxiety. I think one of the things is how do we tap into a lament when it comes to that space? One of the things is that lament uh, needs to be done not just individually, but corporately. That's part of the power of lament. Right now, we're seeing a lot of individual lament. And that has caused people to be even more hyper-individualistic. And so I think right now, one of the languages we need to teach is the language of compassion, corporate compassion, and corporate lament. And the better we model community um, to our young people, um, uh, that will be a part of the working through this kind of combination of hyper-individualism, COVID, and depression, anxiety, 
But if you were to demonstrate as Gen X and as millennials to Gen Z, this is what it means to be a Christian family. This is what it means to be a Christian community. Uh, we really do care about uh, all those that are in our communities, not just those we get along with well because they are of our same class and educational and income levels. Is that example something that our young people want to see? Because I'm not sure they're seeing that in many of our communities. They're not seeing that in our communities. And um, you mentioned earlier this idea around how to be more more human by by connecting with the other you know ethnicities that are around you, the cultures that are around you. I think you write really well about this, and I'll just read something real quick that connected and 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 you basically said this was. Christians had shifted their priority from concern for both individual and larger society to more exclusively a concern for the individual. And it feels like to me that quote in and of itself is really about our discipleship, right? If we've shifted our theological discipleship from a concern individually and corporately to individual, then then even the conversation about how we guide students through lament how do we do that corporately is my question. Yeah. I always get nervous when people read from my books because either you make it sound much better than I wrote or, or a lot worse than I wrote. So thank you. You made, us, you made me sound really smart in that quote. Thank you for picking out the right quotes. I've been quoted like random things. Oh, wait, did I really write that? I hope not. Uh, so thank you for picking out a good quote. Um, yeah, the corporate piece is, is a challenge. Um, and we're, we're seeing this now, right? Because post-COVID, people don't want to go back to church. They like the convenience of the hyper-individualized worship of just seeing on a screen and you just individually consume it. I still get anxious when I go to church uh, and we, we do communion in a hyper-individualistic way. That always throws me off. It's like, wait, where is the sharing at the table? Uh, instead of getting these kind of individualized cups and I'm like, wait, I'm not sure this is the body of this is the body of Christ package for me. That doesn't make sense to me. So these kinds of things where we could actually live the gospel in community, it's getting harder and harder to do. We live more and more in isolation. You know, we even shop alone. Our idea of community must also be challenged because for a long time, and this is generational, boomers and Xers thought in this way, community is a large church of 1,000, 2,000 people. And yeah, there's some benefits of it. There are a lot of resources and there's a lot of programs you can build. Uh, but if underneath that, there isn't the groups of 12 and groups of three that really makes that sense of I belong to not uh, a, a massive crowd of 2,000. Uh, nobody belongs to a crowd, but I belong to a community of 12. I belong to a family of, of three and four. Uh, I belong to a, um, a, a, a community of, of 20 and 30. Um, those are the kind of spaces that I think we can, um, we can continue to build upon. And uh, yes, it might not be as financially lucrative, uh, but I would hope that it's much more spiritually fulfilling. I think also about the word corporate and how hierarchical and yeah. individualistic in a way but corporate means body. It comes from yes. the word corporal. It means to be a body. And I also think about like, what does it mean to be the body of Christ? Like, why are we just worshiping by singing songs or reading from their liturgy? How are we worshiping as a, as a body using our hands, our feet, our lives in our local community and getting to know people in that community and lamenting with them when things go go wrong or when there's injustice in the world that's affecting the local community as well. Yes, and that's where the local church really plays the important role. And I think the local church is the space where that embodiment can and should occur. Um, and the reality of a community where if a part of the body is in pain, if you are dismembered from that body, then the rest of the body does not know. Uh, but you know, if I get, if I stub my toe, my body feels it. It's not just my toe that's in pain. My entire body knows that the toe is in pain. Most of the way we think is mechanistic and get rid of one part and bring in another part versus a body, an organic entity requires much more holistic change. You can't just take a part out and put a part in the holistic change that occurs. And so I think most of our churches and our youth groups, we look for the mechanistic answers. We're a human body, and human bodies are not so easily fixed, are not so easily duplicated or replicated. It has to be 
uh, discipled. It has to be nurtured. It has to be cared for. Uh, there's a lot more investment. Man, that's huge. <laughs> the thing about discipleship is that it's relational. And this is something that we say at, at FYI, we say people over programs, that we yes. need to care about the students that we're discipling and we need to have relationships with them. That's how you get to know, you know what's happening in their lives. That's how you get to sit with them when they are lamenting about something that happened to them and how they get, they understand it's modeled for them that because someone's sharing that space for them, creating that space of vulnerability of like, I'm not going to judge you, but whatever you're going through, that they can then do it for other other friends or that that youth ministry space is a space where anyone can come and like lament with them. That's the beauty of lament in the Bible. So um, my book on lament is actually a commentary in the book of Lamentations. And one of the things I point out that in the book of Lamentations, it doesn't take on Jeremiah's voice. In all probability, Jeremiah wrote that book um, mainly because there's really no other literate person left in Jerusalem after the exile. So Jeremiah is writing the book of Lamentations, but it's definitely not in his voice. So I compare it to like uh, Jeremiah is written in the style of Shakespeare and Lamentation is written in the style of uh, Tupac or Kendrick Lamar. It's very different voices. Jeremiah actually shuts his voice down. And the voice you hear are the voices of the widows, the orphans, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and the sick, those who have suffered the most in that society. Those are the voices that get lifted up. And I think there are times when, yeah, when we're in youth ministries where maybe our communities are fairly wealthy, we got through the pandemic fairly unscathed. At that moment, maybe it's not time to talk too much. Maybe it's time to shut down those voices of triumph to say, but what about those communities that didn't make it through? What about the communities that are still reeling from the pandemic? What about the communities that are still in the churches that still are not back on their feet? Um, how do we deal with those communities? And so it's the, the, the willingness to shut down privilege, the willingness to lay down power in order for the voices of those who have suffered the most, let their voices rise up front and center. Mm, that is so good. I love that, the idea that church leaders and specifically youth leaders to slow down and stop being Jeremiah's and continuing to lament and provide space for that, man, that's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, thanks so much for like, I feel like we can just keep going on and on, <laughs> but it's time for our lightning round. Um, right. And these are questions that we actually asked our um, research participants, or these are inspired by those questions. Um, and these questions are one one word or one sentence answer. There's no right or wrong answers. These are entirely subjective. Okay, so here we go. When you were a teenager, who taught you the most about love? I had to be my mom. Absolutely. We get a lot of those for the, yes. <laughs> this answer. What is the greatest lesson you've learned about forgiveness? Uh, in this case, it's my dad having to forgive and receive forgiveness from him. That was probably the biggest lesson. Okay, and in this season of life, compassion looks like? <laughs> Honestly, survival. Just kind of making it through the day. Yeah, I, I we get that. <laughs> we get, I'm sure a lot of our listeners also really resonate with that. Okay, um, what gives you hope? Kids, my kids, and also the possibility that things can be better in 10 years and that the church might be a part of that good thing that could be better in 10 years. I think, uh, yeah, the youth for me are also um, the youths. <laughs> Gen, <laughs> Gen Z and Gen Alpha definitely give me a lot of hope. Okay. Um, on a scale of one to 10, with one being low and 10 being high, how much humility do you have? <laughs> well, you know, that's this is a setup because like, you know, there, I, knew a, I knew someone in seminary who was voted the most humble in seminary. And uh, when he when he won, he just, yeah, I'm the most humble. So what am I supposed to say to that? So either way, I lose. I'll say five just to be safe and say I've got much to be more humble about, but I don't want to deny that God has blessed me and gifted me and, and get done good things. So I think the most humble answer I can give is five. <laughs> that's true. It is a trick question, but also that's a great answer. <laughs> um, okay, last one. When something is hard, what is a practice that helps you persevere? Oh, wow, that's good. That's a really good one. That's, but this is a lightning round. The first thing that popped into my head uh, was, was self-care. Um, and I'll say it more specifically. I'm a huge baseball fan. 
and this year I've had a kind of a tough year. So I've uh, kind of dedicated to catch about seven games of my favorite hometown team, and I've done three out of three out of seven. Um, so I think there are times that you can it's it's legit for youth pastors to find the place that to go for the things that give them joy, because there's a lot of times that things that don't give you joy. And for me, uh, my favorite baseball team gives me joy, and to be able to go to seven different stadiums this summer is going to give me joy. So when things are, it's okay to pursue joy. It's okay to pursue places where you find, where you find kind of the, the grace of God to experience that. Yeah, I love, I love okay, hearing I the different ways people do that at having joy. I love that. Absolutely love that. Hey, so thank you so much for joining us again. We so appreciate you spending the time with us. Um, it's been a blessing. And um, in light of our whole entire conversation, um, we've been asking our guests if they could give us and specifically our, our, our the youth leaders that uh, listen and are alongside of us, can you give us a benediction? Absolutely. The Lord bless you and keep you, and the Lord calls his countenance to shine upon you, which means that God is God's favor is upon you. Not that all things will be perfect and good, not that you will be in triumph and exceptionalism and victory all the time, but that God's eyes and his heart is on you. And sometimes that might mean pain, sometimes that might mean suffering, but God's presence is always there. You go to the heights, he will be there. You go to the depths, he will be there. And may that presence of God the face of God, the countenance of God, shine upon you on this day. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is one of the many free resources produced by the Fuller Youth Institute. Check out the show notes for all the links and resources mentioned in today's episode. Want to know more about our upcoming curriculum, Compassion from the Inside Out? go to fulleryouthinstitute.org slash curriculum. Thanks so much for listening. And here are some final thoughts from young people. When have you experienced love? Apart from <laughs> your mom or any other kind of love? <laughs> um, I think it'd be towards Jesus. Because I have loved him since I was a child. And then there's a point where I stopped loving him because I was blaming blaming him for things that were happening in my life. So, yeah, because my love for him is going to stop one point, but I'm going to love him again. Why do you feel like you can love Jesus again, even after times when you don't love Jesus? It's the small things. Like, sometimes you don't notice that he's there or he's listening to your prayers or listening to you at all. But he's always going to be there. How about the word love? What does love mean? If you love someone and you take their interests to heart, and I feel like that's what leaders have. They take their people's interest to heart so that they know what's good for their people. And so I feel like it also has to be like self-love. I feel like that's what leaders need to like have or like what they do have. They need to understand self-love in order to give other people love and provide for their needs. Mm-hmm.